There are thousands of anatomical landmarks. I've got about 50 of them that I'd like you to learn. I chose these because many of them are of uh, clinical significance. So let's look at the skull first, then we'll look at the vertebral column, and then we'll look at some of the long bones. All right, first the skull. The frontal bone, that's out in front. We have two parietal bones, one on each side. There's two temporal bones, one on each side by the ear. And we have the occipital bone that's in the back. The upper jaw is called the maxilla. The lower jaw is called the mandible. And then we also have two nasal bones, one on each side. And then I'm going to point out different um, openings along the way. This is, this is a foramen. Here's another view of the skull. This is a frontal view. So here's the frontal bone. On the side, we have the two parietal bones in blue. Here's the temporal bone in red. You can see that just a little bit on either side. Here's the nasal bone, one on each side. And then here's a foramen. Here's another foramen. And this is the mandible again. And then the upper jaw is called the maxilla. So I want you to know all the ones that are circled. Here's the inferior view of the skull, but we're looking at the same bone still. The occipital bone is in the back. We have the temporal bone, one on each side. And then here's, this is called the frame and magnum. This is where the spinal cord exits from the brain. Um, this is part of the maxilla. Remember, that's the upper jaw. And then we can also see um, some of the frontal bone in here as well. This is if we took a horizontal or cross section or transverse section of the skull and looking at the cranial vault. So just like before, frontal bone is up front, the occipital bone is in the back, and then the temporal bone is in red. You can see we have one on each side. And then the parietal bone is in blue. We have one on each side as well. Here's a um, sagittal view of the skull or sagittal section, I should say. We're looking at it from the side. Here's the frontal bone in front. Here's something new, though. I'd like you to um, learn the frontal sinus. Sinus, remember, is just a cavity. Um, there's lots of sinuses. We'll just learn two. Here's the nasal bone again. Here's the maxilla, the upper jaw. The lower jaw is the mandible. The occipital bone in back. Here's the um, frame and magnum, or the big opening where the spinal cord exits. And then here's the parietal bone on the side and the temporal bone on the side as well. So here are the two sinuses I'd like you to know. The frontal sinus, which is encased by the frontal um, bone, and then the maxillary sinus, that's a cavity or opening inside the maxilla. So sometimes if you get um, like a cold and you have a toothache, um, it's because you have infection that's in your maxillary bone and then that, or in your maxillary sinus rather, and that's pushing on the nerves that um, innervate your teeth. So here's another view, sagittal view. Here's the frontal sinus, and here's the maxillary sinus. So the upper jaw has been cut away. Frontal sinus again, and maxillary sinus. Here's a great picture um, of a real skull that's been cut along the frontal plane, or coronal plane, and you can see the maxillary sinus very well. Now let's look at the vertebral column. So the vertebral column, that's all the vertebrae. There's seven cervical vertebrae, that's the vertebrae in the neck. There's 12 thoracic vertebrae. Those are easy to spot because the thoracic vertebrae all articulate with a rib. There's five lumbar vertebrae. And then the sacrum is made up of five fused vertebrae. And the coccyx is made up of four fused vertebrae. So if we wanted to count these, this is the cervical member up here. We could say this is C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. And this would be T1. We'd work our way all the way down to T12. And then the first lumbar vertebrae would be L1. The last one would be L5. Here's looking at a cervical vertebrae. There's three things I want you to know um, on all the vertebrae. I want you to be able to spot the vertebral body. This is where the intervertebral disc sits. There's the transverse process, which on cervical vertebrae are very small. And there's the spinous process, which pokes out posteriorly. And in the case of the cervical vertebrae, um, they're bifurcated or split into two, bifid spinous process. Now there's two special cervical vertebrae. 
It's the top two or most superior vertebrae. It's the um, uh, atlas and the axis. The name atlas comes from um, this figure in Greek mythology. He was thought to hold up the world. And in the same way, the atlas holds up the skull. And then the atlas rotates around this dens process or the dens of the axis bone. So this um, animation, in fact, shows it better than what I can explain. So let's take a look at that. Called the atlantoaxial joint is located in the upper portion of the cervical spine. It consists of the C1 and C2 vertebrae and the anatomical structures connecting them. This segment provides rotational motion, supports the head, and protects the spinal cord and nerve pathways. The C1 and C2 vertebrae are connected in the back by a pair of facet joints. The ring-shaped atlas rotates around the dens, which is the peg-like bony projection of the axis. Articular cartilage enables the smooth movement around the dens and within the facets, while muscles, tendons, and ligaments help hold the vertebrae together. A strain or a tear to any of these tissues can cause neck pain and stiffness. Fortunately, the atlas and axis are easy to identify. The atlas is the only vertebrae that does not have a vertebral body. And the axis is the only one that has this dens or this process that sticks out. And it still has the spinous process and it still has these transverse um, processes as well. Let's look at some thoracic vertebrae. So same things that I want you to know. I want you to be able to spot the body of the vertebrae, also the spinous process, and the transverse process. And remember, the thoracic vertebrae are the ones that articulate with ribs. So this is a rib. The rib is articulating with multiple spots on this thoracic vertebrae. Remember, there's 12 thoracic vertebrae and 12 pairs of ribs. Seven pairs articulate directly with the sternum. There's three pairs that articulate indirectly. You can see that their cartilages don't all directly connect to the sternum. And then there's two ribs at, at, the, at the bottom that don't connect to the sternum at all. So the seven that connect directly, those are called true ribs. The three that connect indirectly are called false ribs. And the two that don't connect at all are called floating ribs. Lumbar vertebrae, really no different. We still have the body, we have the transverse process, and we have the spinous process. So here's a lateral view, there's the body, there's the transverse process, and there's the spinous process. Now, if we're looking at the three vertebrae, we want to compare them. Um, they're not especially challenging to tell apart. The cervical vertebrae are smaller. The vertebral body is small, and their transverse processes are very stubby. The thoracic vertebrae have a larger body, and their spinous process projects both posteriorly and inferiorly. The lumbar vertebrae have the largest vertebral body, and their spinous process is, is it's, it's, it's kind of wide like this, and it largely just projects posteriorly. It doesn't have that inferior slant that the thoracic vertebrae do. The sacrum, that's down here, that's five fused vertebrae. And the coccyx, that's four fused vertebrae. So the sacrum, there's really nothing that I want you to know on the sacrum other than just it articulates with the pelvic bone. And then in between the two pelvic bones is the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis, just like the intervertebral disc, is made of fibrocartilage. Before we leave our discussion of the pelvis, we should at least point out um, this one interesting feature. The way that you can tell the difference between um, a male pelvis and a female pelvis, well, there's several ways, but one easy way is look at the pubic symphysis. The angle that's formed here for men is less than 90, and for women, the angle is greater than 100. The only thing I want you to know, the only landmark I want you to know on the pelvic bone or the hip bone is this. This is the acetabulum. The acetabulum is where the head of the femur articulates. Now let's look at some long bones. Here's the humerus. The humerus has a head made out of articular or hyaline cartilage. It has what's called the anatomical neck. 
And then also has the surgical neck. The surgical neck is the frequent site of fractures. And then at the distal end, um, there's a fair bit going on, but I just want you to know that this surface, this high line um, cartilage or this ar articular cartilage here, um, this is called the condyle. This is the condyle here, and we'll look at that again in a moment. Now let's work our way further down the arm, more distally. Let's look at the two bones of the distal upper extremity. There's only two things I want you to know. On the ulna, I want you to be able to identify the olecranon process. That's this. And on the radius, I'd like you to be able to identify the head of the radius. So let's look at that together. This is the olecranon process on the ulna, and that articulates with the condyle right here. And this is the head of the radius, and that articulates with the other part of the condyle on the humerus. So this is the anterior view. This is the posterior view of the elbow joint. See the olecranon and the radial head? Now let's look at the femur, the lower extremity. The acetabulum is on the hip bone, remember, and that's where the head of the femur articulates. So we have the head of the femur, we have the neck of the femur, and then we have these two um, projections. This is called the greater trochanter, this is the lesser trochanter. So here it is again. Here's the head, this is the neck, the greater trochanter, and the lesser trochanter. And then on the posterior, um, the same landmarks are visible, head, neck, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. And then on the distal end, what I'd like you to know are these two condyles. We have the medial condyle and the lateral condyle. And you can see those on um, anterior or posterior view, but it's easier to spot on the posterior. Now we're looking at the distal extremity of the lower limb. We have the tibia and the fibula. On the tibia, I'd like you to know the lateral condyle and the medial condyle. And also at the distal end, I'd like you to know the medial malleolus or medial malleolus, depending on how you want to say it. And on the fibula, just two parts. I want you to be able to identify the head and then distinguish that from the lateral malleolus or malleolus. So let's look at how the tibia and fibula articulate with the ankle. The medial malleolus, this one's fractured, and the lateral malleolus. The medial malleolus is on the tibia, and the lateral malleolus is on the fibula. 